Good afternoon, everyone. I, I think we're going to go ahead and get start. Uh, we're waiting for one of our guests to arrive, but I, I think we'd like to, to get going, and uh, we appreciate your, your coming today. Uh, my name is David Harris. It's Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice, and I want to welcome you to Harvard Law School on behalf of the Institute. Uh, we're really pleased that this is our first uh, fall event, and uh, we can't think of anything better, any better way than uh, to uh, celebrate a, a, a very uh, enjoyable and fruitful collaboration we've had with the uh, African American Mayors Association in producing this work. Uh, I also have to sh give a shout out of thanks to those who helped support it, but especially to uh, Patrick Mason, who uh, did, did the heavy lifting on the uh, research, and Zoline Hill, who also helped, did a lot of research on education. Uh, those of you who are familiar with, with our institute know that the Houston Marshall that our major project is the Houston Marshall Plan for Community Justice. And uh, the plan has eight topic areas that we're concerned with, education, housing, transportation, coalition building, technology, safety and healing, which the rest of the world calls criminal justice, uh, and economic stability. As Charles Hamilton Houston reminded us long ago, in this uh, kind of, in this quest for justice, all our struggles have to tie in. And as I thought about today's event, I thought that there's certainly at least three tags that we could have used, uh, education, technology, and economic stability. As those of you who attend our events know, I also am not big on long introductions to a program. So before we get going, I want to just make some announcements about some, some upcoming events we'll be having. Uh, next Wednesday, September 25th, we'll have a lunch talk by Jim Marshall discussing, <clears throat> excuse me, discussing his, a really fascinating uh, book he's done called The Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and the Kennedy Administration, 1960 to 1964. And this is a history that he's done by looking at incredible number of documents, and it's going to be a credit talk. On October 7th, we're co-hosting a talk by Professor Randall Kennedy, uh, who's going to speak on Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I don't know if any of you were here. Uh, Professor Kennedy also gave a talk on Charles Hamilton Houston's birthday, September 3rd, uh, which was really quite a hit. On November 5th, in anticipation of Veterans Day, uh, we'll screen Invisible Soldiers, Unheard Voices, which is a documentary about the experience of uh, African American uh, soldiers in World War II. And on November 16th, we're co-sponsoring a screening of Rigged, uh, the Voter Suppression Playbook, which is a fascinating look at what's been going on uh, to suppress the vote. If you're not already on our uh, email list, I encourage you to go to our website, charleshamiltonhouston.org, and sign up, because there will be other events that I haven't mentioned that will be coming forward soon. So I'm going to leave it to my colleague, uh, Stephanie Mash sykes to, to, to really uh, set the context for today. Uh, but it's important for me to underscore how thankful we are for the invitation to be able to cl collaborate with the association on this work. Uh, that uh, relationship is one of the most important ones we have, and indeed, you know, it, it's interesting because uh, last year, our, our first uh, event was an event with Mayors Karen Weaver and Tony Harp, uh, Mayor Weaver from Flint and Tony Harp from uh, <coughs> New Haven, which the association helped us uh, set up. So maybe we'll have a little tradition of having African American mayors here to kick off our year as we go forward. Uh, we've started a nice tradition. Uh, so uh, I also want to ex extend a thanks to, to Jamie Pascal. Where, where is she? Uh, uh, and, and I think all, all of us involved in this project do so because she really helped hold it together and got us here. And, uh, and, and I'm really thankful. So I want to give a little round of applause to Jamie. I don't know, try to embarrass you if I could. <laughs> okay. um, so, and again, for those veterans of our events, you know that this is the time when I usually give thanks and praise to Kelly Garvin, uh, who for 10 years has been the one who helped us do these events. And she, she never shows up, uh, and she's not here today, but today it's not out of shyness or humility. It's because she has a beautiful, wonderful one-month-old baby, and she's on leave, uh, which has made things really interesting for us, but we're really happy for her. And in her absence, I have to thank another colleague of mine, uh, Katie Naples Mitchell, who stepped up and helped uh, kind of fill in for Kelly. So one last note is that following the event, we'll have a reception uh, next door uh, in Milstein A. And uh, with that, I want to turn, uh, uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Stephanie Mashsites.
Thank you, David. I appreciate every one of you for coming out tonight. I just want to give David another round of applause because he has been an amazing partner to the African American Marriage Association. Uh, he was pivotal in us being only the second civil rights oriented organization to receive funding from google.org to do this important work. So just thank you again, David. So again, my name is Stephanie Mash Sykes. I serve as the executive director and general counsel of the African American Mayors Association, and we are so excited to be here this evening. As you may know, the African American Mayors Association is the only organization exclusively representing black mayors across the country, and it is our commitment that black mayors will remain at the forefront of our country's most important issues. And as David suggested, we're more than happy to have a black mayor at Harvard anytime. <laughs> there are over 500 across the country. So David, we're gonna take you up on that offer. Let us know. And tonight, we will be discussing the impact that automation will have on black and Latino workers and how cities and their constituents can prepare for what's coming based on our research and recommendations. We encourage you all to join the discussion online using the hashtag AAMATOR19 and mentioning our Twitter handle at Our Mayors. I would like to thank our research partners, Google, Naleo, Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for their contributions towards this research. I would also like to acknowledge our business council partner, ARP, for sponsoring tonight's event. It has been an honor to work with our partner cities, Columbia, South Carolina, Gary, Indiana, Long Beach, California, to produce an extensive research project that will help city leaders across the country prepare communities of color for the future of work. Under the leadership of President Hardy Davis of Augusta, Georgia, we will continue our commitment to provide resources and actionable recommendations to cities nationwide. If you enjoy tonight's discussion, I would just like to invite everyone to participate with all of our country's mayors at our annual conference in April 2020 in Atlanta, Georgia, hosted by Keisha Lance Bottoms. So I welcome you all to attend. Please go to our website, www.ourmayors.org to learn more about the conference. So at this time, I'm gonna go right into the research. I may need technical assistance to get to my slides. Thank you again to Jamie. <laughs> That's not ours. There we go. Slideshow. Thank you for that demonstration that we'll still need people even with automation, so thank you so much, Jamie. Um, so I have the honor to just present a high-level glimpse of the work. There are hard copies of our white paper on seats. If you don't have one, we still have some extras, so please take that home to uh, read their research in depth. Uh, this research marries both the economic reporting out from our um, colleague, Dr. Patrick Mason, as well as Dr. Zoline Hill, who cannot be here today, also for maternity leave. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in and really talk about the purpose of the work. We have seen that there is a challenge that automation is going to present for black and Latino communities. It's changing the landscape of jobs and a significant percentage of existing jobs, especially manual and low-skilled jobs, are becoming obsolete. The impacts of this job loss will likely have an unequal distribution. But with this challenge, there is an opportunity. And the opportunity is that jobs requiring creative intelligence, social skills, perception, and manipulation are less susceptible to automation. Individuals with computer skills are better positioned to take advantage of new jobs. So our motivating question was what can city leaders do to understand and plan for the future of work? We wanted to move from a deficit model that the sky is falling, that there won't be jobs, that black and Latino workers won't be employed to say, what are the tools available? What are they doing? How can we give a manual of instructions and recommendations that are actionable for our mayors of all city sizes? Our partner cities are Columbia, South Carolina, led by Mayor Steve Benjamin, 
uh, the city of Gary, Indiana, led by Mayor Karen Fre Freeman Wilson that you will hear from this evening, and the city of Long Beach, California, led by Mayor Robert Garcia. Our approach was twofold. First, more of an economic focus and understanding the economic and occupational landscape in each city, as well as looking deeply into the education and training opportunities that each city already possesses. So a quick snapshot, you all can read, so I won't go through all of the data, but we're just going to provide a quick snapshot of Gary and Columbia and Long Beach. Each of our cities range from around 100,000 to less than 500,000. We thought that was the sweet spot for cities that would need assistance that may not have a robust uh, workforce development plan or staffing. And so we thought we would start there um, for our research. So Gary, 77,000, median earnings, 32,000, a little over 32,000, and the general unemployment rate for their working population of 13%. When you look at Columbia, South Carolina, the population is 132,000. The median earnings is a, are a little over 40,000, and the unemployment rate is 6%. Taking a look at Long Beach, California, the population is on the higher end of our cities that we studied, of 470,000, with the median earnings of 46,000, with the unemployment rate of 7,000. So let's get to our findings. The economic landscape, no surprises here. Black and Latino workers disproportionately hold occupations that are vulnerable to automation. And before I get to the next slide, I want to let you know that there are two models that we are looking at that have a range of um, uh, anticipated job loss um, estimates. So when you look at the first model, this is the risk of automation for specific jobs held by black and Latino populations in these cities. You see that there's a potential that up to nearly 50% of jobs held by black and Latinos in, this, in these cities could be susceptible to automation and risk job loss for these populations. When you look at the second model, you see slightly slower um, numbers because we, we're looking here at the actual, de the future demand for jobs held by these populations. So these numbers range closer to you know, 10, 15, 16% across ethnicity and city. Then we looked at the education and training landscape of these cities. We looked at uh, information from the Department of Education, the local boards of education, specifically high school curriculum offerings. We also looked at technical schools and community colleges, um, as well as both public and private colleges and universities. Um, on the state level side, we also looked at apprenticeship training programs, funding for tech schools and scholarships. And you'll find in the white paper that you have very specific information on programming on the various cities. So um, for brevity tonight, I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but each city currently has tools in their wheelhouse that they can use to help mitigate the job losses for both black and Latino um, workers in their cities. So the broad findings that were relevant to all three cities are that black and Latino workers have lower levels of college preparation, attendance, and graduation when you look at their white counterparts. Schools vary greatly in variety and availability of STEAM, and the A is now arts. So beyond the science and technical education, we're also um, looking at arts education and that states and localities have initiated workforce development initiatives that have various levels of success. So when we go to our recommendations, which I think is really how our report differentiates ourselves uh, from some of the information that's out there because we're really looking at the tools, again, that mayors and cities have to help focus on um, black and Latino workers and the jobs of the future. So first, we look at, uh, we recommend expanding training for careers of the future, particularly increasing access to relevant, high quality STEAM career and technical education, particularly working with industry leaders to develop that curriculum, um, making use of distant learning to meet educator and training gaps, and expanding collaboration between schools and local, local projected high demand industries. Again, that's the private public partnership piece. And also providing early and rigorous academic support. If you're in a city where you have a low graduation rate, 
talking about college engineering is not going to fix the problem. So we saw that in cities that have low high school education, graduation rates, you really need to be providing a early and rigor rigorous academic support at earlier levels than previously considered. We also want to recommend develop pipe, developing pipelines from high school to post-secondary training programs, um, leveraging already existing state training programs, the new development of an information dissemination platform, and also developing data management, a data management system to track the success of various job training programs. Because as we saw, some of the programs were underrepresented by black and Latino workers and had various levels of success. So we want to focus on really looking at a data-based approach to um, tracking the success of job training programs. So with that, I just want to thank our partners on the work, our mayors, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, Mayor Benjamin, and Mayor Garcia, our researchers, both Dr. Mason and Dr. Hill in their absence. Again, our partner forum for this evening, ARP. We could not, again, we could not have done this without David's leadership here at the Houston Institute. Google, Nileo, and of course our organization. And I want to give another round of applause to Jamie Pascal, who's the project manager from the inception to the completion. And tonight is our culmination event. So uh, thank you all. And without further ado, we want to move into the discussion portion of this evening so that we can make sure that there um, is plenty of time for questions. I can answer uh, questions about the research at the end. Again, there's copies for everyone. So without further ado, I want to bring up Mike Muse, who is our moderator and award-winning host of various Series XM programs. And he's going to give a little self-introduction and then bring up our panel. So thank you all. All right, all right, all right. Good afternoon, Harvard. Good afternoon, Harvard. Hey, I love that. I have this all uh, personal thing where every city I go to, I like to engage in that type of opening mantra. Um, so I'm trying to challenge myself every time to see who has the coolest introduction. Uh, so far, I think the coolest one for me is I've said I wanted to thank the Academy. So uh, I'm waiting to top that. But I think Harvard, you guys are up there. So I'm excited to be here. Stephanie, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. The work that you guys are doing at the African American Mayor Association is simply fantastic. Uh, David Harris, the work that you guys are doing here is incredible. I have been studying and reading up on all the fantastic work, so cheers to you. And Jamie, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> thank you for all your tireless work and your emails. It has been more than helpful. I am super excited to be here today as I keep reiterating that for all the reasons uh, that my bio does not suggest. Uh, I come from a small city, so I come from Lansing, Michigan, actually. I am also, too, an industrial engineer um, from the University of Michigan, and I've also done nuclear chemical research. Uh, my first internship was actually General Motors. Uh, and while at GM, we were really focused on, I would call it then, the future of work and what the future of work would look like through the lens of lean manufacturing, right? I know we have, we're recording this, we're on videos. I don't want to say the year specifically because I still claim millennial set. Um, <laughs> but if I actually date what I was, I think they may be able to do the math on that one. Um, but nonetheless, really focus on lean manufacturing and really figuring out how we can increase uh, productivity, um, but with less expenses. And of course, less expenses means human capital. And so we were doing that back then. And so that was a talk. And so I've always seen that this is direction of where manufacturing is going to specifically. And so I have a very special personal uh, interest in this conversation, this dialogue. As a result, I've been doing a lot of work with Google in the, in the space of um, AI, machine learning, and big data. And how do we create tech policies around those spaces and places to really um, make sure we focus on those who would be impacted most, right? Marginalized communities, people of color, uh, the entrepreneurship space. And so I've been doing a deep dive on that for the last three years now. So this is right at my wheelhouse. I am a geek at heart, and I am super excited to get involved in this conversation. The research paper, if you have not had the chance to read the white paper yet, I encourage you to read it. It is quite fascinating. Uh, it's in-depth, 
So cheers to you, to Stephanie, and to the entire team who participated in that. Uh, so enough of me talking. Uh, I am going to bring up my distinguished uh, panelists so we can engage in a robust conversation with all of you. Uh, first up to the stage, I want to call the African American Mayor's Association President, uh, Mayor Hardy Davis Jr. of Augusta, Georgia. Come on up, Mr. Mayor. Hey. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, my only goal today is to do a good enough job so I can get invited to the Masters. So uh, hopefully you can hook a brother up with some tickets. <laughs> uh, next coming up to the stage is the president of the National League of Cities uh, and the former mayor of Gary, Indiana, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson. What's happening, Karen? We love some Gary, Indiana. I just had the chance to interview one of the Jacksons recently. Oh, so wow. yeah, cool. so really excited to be in conversation with Gary. Uh, next coming to the stage, uh, we have the African American Mayor's Association Future of Work Economic Researcher, uh, Dr. Patrick Mason. Come on up, Dr. Mason from Florida State University. We often battle you at the University of Michigan for college football Saturday, so <laughs> go blue. I'm gonna rub that in just a little bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, and then coming up to the stage, followed by that, uh, we have a dynamic, Cindy of Alaska, Deputy Director of Constituency Services for Naleo. What's happening? <laughs> I don't have any personal connection with Naleo, so I can't really say anything cool as I introduce you. Los Angeles. Oh, LA, okay. Oh, Lakers. All right, Lakers. Okay, here we go. King James, right? Yes. LeBron James is they a friend. They wouldn't let me back into LAX if I didn't say that in Yeah. <laughs> well, I follow King James no matter where he goes now, so now I'm a Lakers fan, so Excellent. did not know that. <laughs> Let's get that championship. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have Sandra Harris, uh, the Massachusetts State President for AARP. Come on up. Ms. Harris. Now, Ms. Harris, we haven't met before, but my mother warned me up for our conversation this morning. So I was literally in the airport, uh, and she calls me up. She says, hey, I see you're going to Boston, and ARP is sponsoring it. I was just reading about on the cover, uh, ARP's magazine, is the marijuana plant. Uh, <laughs> so she was so excited to learn the deep dive that you guys have done and uncovered about the cannabis oil and the effects of cannabis and all the kind of cool stuff. So my mother is a member, uh, and she made me aware of that this morning with marijuana. What please a great way to start your morning her, off with your mother. Please give her our regard. Yeah, I absolutely will, man. So I'm super excited. Let's go uh, get the conversation going. I actually want to frame this conversation with this statement that actually comes from uh, the research, the white paper itself. Um, it says that the Institute, uh, and Dr. Um, Dr. Patrick Mason, I'm coming to you first with this one. Um, and so, for your first, my first question for you. But in the framing of it, this conversation, it says, the Institute for the Future reports that 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't even been invented yet, and that we will see a drastic change in the nature of work as we know it. The pace of change will be so rapid, which leads to the question of how will people, particularly black and Latino workers, be affected, and how can we get ahead of this transition? The reason I wanted to come to you, because as education, I was in, and I'm going to say this intentionally, just to understand the scope and dynamic of where we are with disparity and gaps and equality and inequities. Um, I was vacationed in Martha's Vineyard probably about four or five years ago, um, and I was with uh, a great family friend, and I was visiting with their daughter, who was in 10th grade at the time, um, and she and I were just talking about what does she want to do when she grew up. And I said, do you have an interest in what you want to major in? And she said, no, not yet. Uh, she said, I'm trying to think of a career uh, that hasn't even been invented yet, right? And so here was this right rising 10th grader who was already thinking about the future of work approximately four years ago before future work became a tagline, right? But then I actually go to the notion of this privilege, right? And then prison education, she goes to a boarding school in the uh, New Jersey area, I don't want to be too specific here, and then <laughs> in the New Jersey area, um, and clearly her family is of means and they travel and vacation to really great spaces and places, so she has that awareness. But my concern is for individuals who don't have that awareness. My concern is for individuals who don't have the ability to send their kids to a boarding school, right, and private school systems. Um, so with that being said, as you looked at the future work within this space and this work um, regarding job laws, what are some of the things that you have con concluded in terms of the trends and where we're going with job laws? But if you can kind of tie that into education, education gap. Well, as I think about what's happening with automation and computers, first of all, 
it's not something that's going to happen. Can you get up mic just a little bit because we are recording, so I want to make sure we so get this picked up. As I think about automation and computers and what's happening with the trend of work, it's not something that's going to happen. It's something that is already happening in, in a really dramatic fashion. Um, many, 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 many years ago, when I was an undergraduate, you would, you know, working with a computer doing statistical analysis meant getting some stuff on cards and going to a lab and, you know, having the computer sort the cards and mm -hmm. you, 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 you know, you do all of your stuff at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. And if you're lucky, a mainframe somewhere would spit out the results the next morning. Yes. This thing has more power than mm -hmm. the mainframes that we were working with back then. Mm -hmm. And it will do more things. And it's pervasive. Everybody has a cell phone. In fact, uh, in some separate research I was doing, we found out that African Americans and Latinos were less likely to own desktops, computers. And that kind of worried me, but then I saw they were more likely to own smartphones, because smartphones are cheaper than desktops. Yeah. And they allow access to the internet. So there's an adjustment made. And I think that that's what will happen in the future. Uh, as, as new jobs come online, some of which we don't know about, but young people today in school are already being computerized. And even, even at home, um, partly because I'm, I'm, I'm very cheap and partly out of curiosity, <laughs> whenever something breaks in my house, my first instinct is not to call a repair person. Okay. My first instinct is YouTube. I was just about to say that. <laughs> Same here. So you go online to YouTube and, you know, Sears will show you how to take apart the washer and dryer, how to take apart the washing machine, and you can, uh, how to, you know, do anything you want to do to your riding mower. So that's already becoming part of our culture. And the children in school today, they're, they're already becoming familiar with that. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't um, room for public policy to do some things because automation will continue to create inequality, continue to push some people out of employment, as, even as it creates new jobs, and continue to alter the, the educational requirements of the workforce. So we have to think about how to adjust the educational requirements to those continuously changing requirements. And, you know, as, as um, some of the background in economics and statistics, I'm always upset that people don't love math. <laughs> I don't love <laughs> statistics. Yeah. And I think that's in part because how we teach it. Yes. And that maybe we need to teach it differently and to do more things online. Again, YouTube is already doing a lot of this. Mm -hmm. And we already have distance learning courses. But we need to do more. And we need to try to find ways of, of giving uh, concrete examples of how to apply. Like mathematics and computer, uh, mathematics and statistics are needed to, to understand things like programming. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also need to know a lot of math in order to be a carpenter. Yeah. Right? So I built a house. And one of the things I found out is that the carpenters and the concrete guys, they can tell you what you need in terms of how much concrete, how much wood. But if you give them that same problem as an algebra equation, they'll just give you a blank look. Mm -hmm. But they can tell you intuitively they know. So we need to take, so, so even in terms of things like vocational training, we need to make it more sophisticated. My dissertation advisor and I had a conversation once, and I said, I took shop in high school. He says, I took shop too. Well, my shop class was woodworking. His shop class was in Pakistan, and it was engineering. <laughs> yeah, different definitions. Yeah. So we need to think of more innovative ways of getting those uh, skills in mathematics and statistics yeah. and other quantitative skills out to, to our young people. 
I'm with you too as well in the sense of we need to teach math and statistics differently. So I had four semesters of calculus, but for some reason statistics was a little bit of a challenge for me. Uh, that's because for me, I looked at math as a language, right? And if right. you understand math as a language, it's easier to dissect and begin to right. understand. But statistics was just a different type of dynamic <laughs> because it was a new language I was learning just for a semester. So I think I had to do it too, to deep dive into it. Uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson, I'm actually gonna come to you now because now we're talking about like education. And I think you're the perfect person to lead off of the comments um, that Dr. Mason so eloquently mentioned, and, and the, the heart of what he's talking about is education. You come from a Gary, Indiana, who's had his challenges of industries, right? I'm thinking about the steel industry, right? And a small city on top of that. So you have, you see firsthand the changing of the guard, right? And, and what happens when industries kind of go under. When it comes to education, uh, are you, what, are you, what keeps you up at night uh, as someone who used to be the custodian of a city, right? Right? and someone who is fighting in the advocacy space now with um, the League of Cities, right? What is keeping up at life with our youth around education? Is it so much the access to quality math and science courses? Is it the access to AP courses that are needed? Um, or is it the whole notion of we're thinking too high level and not grassroots enough level with just basic algebra? So I would say D, all of the above. But uh, first and foremost, let me just thank um, the AAMA and um, all of the sponsors for this opportunity to join this panel. Uh, just one point, Mike, yeah, I sure. don't get off the hook until December 31st. Ah! Uh, so I'm still <laughs> up at night yeah. <laughs> and up during the day. I had you exiting too early, my apologies. But, uh, but you know, when I think about this issue, and, and we were so excited to be included in this study because we've seen this movie before, right, in Gary. We saw it in 1970. U.S. Steel went from employing 25,000 people, that's just at U.S. Steel, mm -hmm. to employing today 4,000 people. And they were largely people with a high school education who left high school, went into the mill, and were able to get jobs where they were able to feed their families and support their families. You saw that in Lansing. Yes. And, um, and it wasn't just those 25,000 people. You had can companies, you had bridge companies, you had everything, uh, auto parts, everything that was made with steel. And so the opportunity to think about this a bit differently um, means that now we can get it right. Because right now, we still have homes that were vacated by those folks who just walked away when the steel industry went down. And you still have the flagship plant for US Steel in Gary. It's just because of automation, because of foreign competition, you only have 4,000 people working. And so you have to start with education. Mm -hmm. You have to start, and, and I would say, not at that high level, but at the uh, level of how do you get kids interested in math at a much younger age? And so what we've done in Gary, our camp, summer camp, looks very differently. Mm. You, you know, um, I loved day camp as a kid, yeah. a long, long, long time ago. Yeah. But, you know, it was all about arts and crafts, sports, swimming, things that were enjoyable, but um, things that we can't simply afford to, uh, now we can't afford to limit mm -hmm. day camp opportunities in our communities. And so you have to think about coding. Mm -hmm. You have to think about uh, how do you get kids interested in all aspects of math, applied math. So um, is there an opportunity for carpentry, engineering? Um, what do you do during the school year? We now have two STEM academies in the city of Gary in middle school. Mm -hmm. So that's important, but not just in middle school, we also have a program that's done with the National Guard called Star-Based Gary where we are able to uh, take folks 
out of the fifth grade for half a day and get them immersed in engineering and, and programs like that. So that's one aspect of it. The other is, do you then say, if I'm going to focus on education, am I just uh, conceding that there's another generation uh, who didn't have these opportunities that are gonna be left behind? Of course not. So we have a program called the 1150 Academy in the state of Indiana that we're about to partner with through workforce development that is literally a coding boot camp, wow. 24 weeks. And it's done all over the state. Uh, they've had success and we're saying, we need you in Gary because what they have said is that anyone who successfully completes their program has an 80% chance of being placed in a job that pays $75,000 or higher. Now you can look in the research in the white paper and find that um, folks with advanced degrees don't make that in the city of Gary uh, on average. Yeah. And so to say that you could go through this boot camp for 24 weeks makes a difference. The last thing I'll say is that has uh, our recognition of automation and of, of what's happening with the future of work has really given rise to our emphasis on entrepreneurism. Uh, we created Art House, a social kitchen, with the assistance of uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies through a public art grant and night in the Knight Foundation. We have a Gary a Micro Business Institute where we train people in really um, pursuing their dreams of being an entrepreneur, whether it's clothing, whether it is uh, professional development, whether it's their effort to be a project manager, all of those things, or whether it's culinary, uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. We have developed that because we know that if you work for yourself, then you may very well never be out of a job. Yeah. And so those are just some thoughts uh, in terms of what we've done in Gary. Those are really great thoughts and, and cheers to the work that you guys are actually doing in Gary. Um, as you were, were talking, what I was gathering from you is just about innovation yeah. um, and how you guys have been able to pivot not only through industries, but then also to innovative ways of technology. And just thinking about my upbringing in, in Lansing, the, we had some type of programs, and that's because our economy was so robust, right? That's because the automotive industry was doing so well. So our city was getting lots of tax revenue that helped support these types of programs. And then we had other economies. Since we were capital city, we had the state. We had Michigan State University that provided a great economy for our workforce and a bunch of other things, which Mayor Davis comes to you now, right? Because of the fact of, you know, in this whole light of coming off of what Mayor Freeman Wilson is discussing in terms of innovation, how do you pivot, how do you change industries, some good work is actually happening in Augusta, right? When it comes to innovation, in particular, the Georgia Cyber Innovation and Training Training Center. I'm just curious about, can you give us a little bit of context of what that was? Why did you guys decide to start this? And what is that fulfilling any gaps uh, that was existing within Augusta? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that question. Uh, I want to take a point of mayoral personal privilege. And uh, one, uh, you've thanked everyone who is sponsoring tonight's event and certainly been a partner. But I do want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the incredible work that was done by our researchers who put this most important document together. Uh, Dr. Zoline Hill, of course, Dr. Patrick Mason, uh, our own Stephanie Mass Sykes, and of course, uh, David D. J. Harris. Uh, this is incredible work in terms of something that, as you've said, uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson, we've seen this picture, we've seen this happen. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of the fact that we're in a very highly automated society today because the reality of it is everyone in almost every sector uh, of the 23 primary occupational sectors that people work in are looking at the fact that when you have repetitive tasks, you're looking for a way to scale. Mm -hmm. You talked about uh, lean manufacturing. Uh, I may be a little older than you, Mike, and we <laughs> called it JIT, just-in-time manufacturing. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I think uh, we studied that. We did. We did. We did. Uh, you're an industrial engineer. Yeah. And I'm an electrical engineer. So, That's how you get it. Yeah. So we understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I'm listening again, and you focus 
uniquely around the city of Augusta. I wrote down three things uh, that I would like to highlight. One, and that is, in today's economy, we're rethinking the American way by reshaping the American dream, by relearning the way America works. When you think about that, uh, in a highly automated society, we took a page out of all of those experiences in Augusta around this issue of cyber innovation and technology. In 2014, Army Cyber uh, was, it was decided that Army Cyber would move to Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, we now have quickly become the cybersecurity capital of the nation. As a result of that, uh, in 2017, uh, the governor made a decision that Augusta would become Georgia's cyber innovation center, cyber innovation and training. And so in a joint partnership between the state, our institution of higher learning, and the city of Augusta, we've stood up 362,000 square feet of public, private, and academic space uh, to solve the world's challenges, and quite frankly, not just the nation, but the world's challenges around cyber and cyber security. Part of that genesis was taking this issue of education and making it translatable, uh, as our study tells us, with a focus around our three cities, that disproportionately in an automated and in, uh, economies and communities of innovation and technology, black and brown workers are going to be disproportionately affected. And so what Augusta did is, in our uh, K through 12 education system, in partnership with the state's Department of Education, we stood up the Cyber Pathways curriculum. In grades three through 12, we're now training our students how to become cyber and innovation and technology professionals. Uh, just incredible opportunity for folks who historically would have been left out of a workforce yeah. that is underrepresented, underserved, but we can't get enough workers in today's economy to meet those jobs. And so we've seen immediate success. We started the first cohort of students in 2016. We've got three years under our belt now. Uh, in this recent graduation class that graduated in May, we had one of our students who walked across the stage as a cybersecurity professional, went into the workforce making 50 plus thousand dollars a year. Wow, out of high school? Out of high school, wow. into the workforce. And so when you link about amazing. communities of mm -hmm. interest, and she was a Latino, yeah. uh, she went into the workforce able to generationally transform her family's future. Mm -hmm. These are things that I think uh, the study bears out that we have a unique opportunity in mm -hmm. our uh, primary and secondary education institutions to refocus around more than just traditional arithmetic, reading, and writing, uh, but to begin partnering with our industries yeah. to talk about what do you need from a workforce perspective so that we can change how we're teaching, but more importantly, what we're teaching early on to give those individuals access. And I think that's a key word, access, particularly to career paths that historically would not have been available yeah. or they would have been the last ones to have those opportunities. And so that's what this work uh, bears witness to in terms mm -hmm. of the research that we've been able to do. And we're very uh, fortunate to have a partner like Harvard to help us with that along with what Google has done. Uh, but I think this is phenomenal work in terms of telling us what the state of job automation is, yeah. but also providing us, Mike, with some examples of what local leaders and policymakers are able to do in terms of developing best practices that are then translatable in the policies that whether it's Gary, Indiana, whether it's Cambridge, Massachusetts, or even in Toledo, Ohio, mm -hmm. you have a framework for things that can be done to create an economy that's equitable in nature around this issue. Well, you mentioned, you, uh, you mentioned something really interesting in terms of uh, this panel today is actually just showcasing, obviously, uh, the great white paper, also to highlighting from a 30,000 foot perspective, the future work, and really doing deep dives into each one of you specifically in the work that you guys are doing. Um, but we have an audience that will be listening to this played back uh, as Stephanie and her great team will get this out. And so it's important that this is not this is viewed as to stir creativity for other policymakers who are watching uh, for
for constituencies who will be voting, right? And to really challenge uh, your elected officials and really to double down on how are they thinking about this and how are they being innovative within this future of work. And that's why I really want to really pinpoint some of the specific examples that you guys are doing to showcase it, to show other cities like Lansing, like the Toledo's, like the Ypsilantes, like the Pontiacs, what is possible. Um, and I think um, Mayor Davis, what you mentioned, it kind of just perk me up for a second. I think uh, Mayor Freeman Wilson, you can really feel me on this one. When you said that she walked off the stage with a 50K job, that sounds like the jobs of yesterday at GM and Ford and Chrysler. That is actually how the black and brown individuals within these smaller cities in particular had entree to the middle class was through those manufacturing jobs. Those individuals walking out of high school into the plant, coming off a wait list, by the way, to get on into the plant, actually made more money than individuals who went to colleges like University of Michigan or to Cambridge. And so I think that's interesting to highlight that's actually happening and cybersecurity isn't going anywhere. Uh, that's gonna be a needed field that we need. Um, so I go now, just turn my attention to um, State President uh, Sandra Harris when it comes to looking at AARP um, because of the fact of, and I'm really glad that you guys are here and I've really been impressed with the branding and the way AARP has been really getting out into society. Not only my mother calling me up about cannabis, but just in the places and the spaces you guys have been in from, from music and the Afropunk and culture and society because we all will get to the age of become members of of ARP soon, and now because of the economy, because of the state we're in, individuals are working longer, right? And so people aren't quite retiring at that low cutoff number of the minimum, the workforce has been extended. And as the work is being extended, clearly jobs are being changed, right? Because of future work, because of automation. How is AARP preparing their members that who are still in the workforce that is actually transitioning to this future of work and through automation? Okay. Thank you, Mike, mm -hmm. um, for that question. I first of all want to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Yes. I want to commend uh, the mayors for this great work. I think this document will inform um, a lot of the work that we're doing as well as other organizations. So thank you and our best wishes. Um, as many of you know, ARP has a long-standing tradition of being in the communities, working um, especially to make sure that Older adults, 50 plus, have an opportunity to live the life they choose to live. And uh, so we, we see this um, document as an opportunity, again, to work with you, to work with our, in our community. There, uh, um, I hope to bring a different lens to this conversation, and that has to do with the fact that we need to, as we begin to look at the future of, of work, to look at the demographics. Ours is an aging population, okay? And um, older workers are becoming the, the largest growing segment of the workforce. And that has, that's gonna make a difference in how we work and how we run our companies and how we um, supply people and have people in the pipelines to do the work that needs to be done in these companies. Uh, in 1994, People 65 and older represented 11% of the total workforce. It's projected by 2024 that will increase to 25%. Yes. Second, labor shortage is real. And it's projected that there's growing in a number of sectors and we need to prepare for that. We have to address these growing needs and who are the people that are going to be in the pipelines to be able to fulfill these jobs. And lastly, many workers intend to live or continue working far beyond 65. Um, and in our work, we say 65 is, is a losing proposition now. You know, nothing happens at 65. It just kind of recharges everybody. We're living longer, and people are continuing to work um, after the age of 65. Many because they desire to, but others because they need the um, financial security. Yeah. Thank you for putting that in context and that framing. And that's really why I wanted to highlight that. And I think your being here is just perfect. I think we have assembled a fantastic panel that really represents different segments of the population and that will be affected by the future of work. And it's really important that we highlight that. And I love that you brought that stat up, that it was going from 11% to 25% to really make individuals aware that you guys are transitioning into that. Now I'm turning to my favorite Laker fan, uh, <laughs> to your right, <laughs> India. I'm really happy that you're here uh, because you represent specifically 
specifically within the Leo, uh, is higher education and workforce development. And so I thought I would end it with you because you said that intersection of what we've all just been just discussing just right now. So clearly I want to give you time to really just kind of give your thoughts about you know, where we are with the future work from your perspective of education. But I'm wondering though, are we doubling down too much when it comes to education on like tech? in STEM, right? And this is coming from someone who was a STEM major, right? And this is coming from someone who doesn't believe in STEAM. I said it. Don't fight me. Don't <laughs> talk to me at the reception later on about it. Um, but I'm just curious about like how how are you guys in the Lego thinking about that dynamic and that conversation? Because everyone isn't geared uh, to take four semesters of calculus, right? Or should we be forcing people to take four semesters of calculus? Yes. What a question. Um, so before I go ahead and tackle it with my allotted time, um, thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. And again, I just want to thank folks for being here. This is an incredibly timely conversation and definitely want to thank our great partners at the African American Mayors Association for collaborating with us on this project um, and for continuing this partnership. Um, for folks that don't know, I'm just going to take a little bit of time. Uh, the Naleo Educational Fund is a nonpartisan national uh, nonprofit organization, and the mission of our organization is to facilitate the full participation of Latinos in the American political process, all the way from citizenship to public service. Um, we have three departments in our organization. I am a part of the constituency services team, and I work with policymakers, predominantly education policymakers, mm -hmm. um, where we explore best practices. Uh, we convene them with other policymakers in order for them to learn from one another. Um, to heighten their expertise in order for them to be the best public servants um, that they could be and serve their communities. I lead the higher education portfolio, and when I started at Naleo, that was sort of the only work that I led. And then it became very apparent that we had to begin to talk about workforce development and incorporate, in, and incorporate that. So for my policy institutes, um, you would see K-12 school board members and com uh, folks that are serving in community colleges, but now, um, we have a cross-jurisdictional audience. Um, we have state legislators coming together with school board members, um, folks that serve at community colleges, and of course, also mayors, um, because this work is very important. I know that the title says um, the future of work, but my policymakers say it's work now. Um, it's not a year or two years or 10 years. We need to figure this out now because work, people are working now and they're being displaced now. Um, in regards to your question, it's always very interesting when you bring in K-12 folks with higher education folks, because before they would be like, that Spider-Man meme where they would point at one another. Yeah. <laughs> like you're not equipping uh, K-12 students to come into higher ed, and the K-12 folks would look at the higher ed folks and say like, well, you're not uh, you know, increasing access or supporting students to finish and attain a degree or certification. Um, and I think with sort of this topic, policymakers are really just coming to the table and say, we really need to collaborate on this because it's too important. I jotted down four things that sort of come to mind um, when policymakers are talking about workforce development because we always say, what is your role? Because we truly believe that there's a role for everyone. So four things um, that our policymakers are currently working on and say, this is what I could do in my jurisdiction that I wanted to share today is um, sort of, you have the power to convene at whatever level you're at, whether you're a state legislator, whether you are a mayor, whether you're a school board member, you could convene stakeholders like business and strengthen those partnerships. You could allocate resources. So if you're at the state legislative level, definitely at the local level, you could go ahead and place those dollars where they make sense. Um, you could also promote and champion policies and strategies. This is very interesting for folks at the K-12 level and also community college level. Um, Interesting partnerships like dual enrollment programs, which I know Indiana has Ivy Tech College. It's very, very hard to even form a partnership. A lot of the strategies and policy recommendations that you see now say like form a partnership and our policymakers say that's the hardest part. Coming to the table together, having the, the key stakeholders at the table, that's the first step, but usually the hardest step. Um, but once you get these partnerships together, they're there and you have programs and what we're finding when talking to our policymakers is that people are not being plugged into those programs. So a lot of this work is already happening in regions, um, but I think the next level of the conversation has to be how do we plug students into it and how do we plug workers that are already in the workforce into retraining programs. And of course, the last thing that our policymakers could always do is pass policy. Um, 
so those are a couple of things that I know that um, our policymakers um, continuously talk about in regards to education and STEM and equipping, I think it, it can't wait. It's, it's now, um, but again, this is why it's a timely conversation. And I know that this work is not gonna change and it's gonna continue. I just wanna thank the mayors here on the table because even though this might heighten, I know it keeps me up at night, um, rest assured that um, leaders like the mayors here on the panel are working on this and, and I know we're gonna be okay. But uh, I'm curious, so in the conversation around the policy around the education, are you guys having that discourse about STEM, the focus on STEM? Is that coming up? Yes, absolutely. And it looks very different. In K-12, of course, everyone wants a STEM academy, a STEM program. What we're finding is there's no STEM teachers to be able to teach these programs. That's what I was getting to, yeah. There's no STEM teachers and a lot of the states, so in one of the things... Um, sort of like when we talk about promoting championing policies, we ask our state legislators, do you have a computer science state curriculum? And a lot of folks go like, you know, we don't. We don't have a computer science curriculum. And then they start looking into certifications for teachers. So they don't have a state sort of curriculum, a guiding document. And then on the other end, there's a lot of teachers that are willing to to sort of teach these courses, but we're finding that the certification process, which differs for all states, are different. So that is sort of at the very end. Of course, they're talking about STEM. They want all kids to be digitally savvy. When we think about sort of automation and the work of the future, we think of IT. In truth, this technology had, it has its fingerprints all over. Yeah. Um, every occupation, I'm thinking of my cousin who's a janitor and has been a janitor for 30 years, now has to write emails to get supplies. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what? What do you mean I have to write an email? I, could, I, I just wanna go to your office and ask you, I need supplies. That, that's automation, folks. That's, that's, that's how technology is changing every occupation. So for K-12, sort of they're looking at the computer side. It, it starts earlier than just sort of the programs that you see implemented. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Davis, as you want to yeah, respond? Yeah, can I add something to that? I think this whole conversation around education uh, is extremely important, uh, particularly when we talk about the onboarding process for early childhood education. We're talking about introducing children and students to these uh, opportunities early. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it's so important that every state uh, makes emphasis around early childhood education. I mean, I've got nieces, nephews, and I'm sure you all do as well, and those of you in the audience who already know how to use these devices, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to then take that, I know how to use this, and translate it into something more meaningful than just playing Mario Brothers or something right. like that. Uh, so I think uh, to uh, Cynthia's point, uh, what we've done in Georgia from a state perspective is dual enrollment students can attend as a high school student. You can go to the technical school or the university, and it's paid for 100%, um, which is unique. Uh, we pay for it 100%. Uh, so you're able to not only graduate from high school, but in many instances, move through the university system or technical college system, and by the time you graduate from high school, you can also go right into the workforce because you've got our 18 to 24 month certificate or a degree. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, we have a young man uh, who went through that program uh, at the technical school where my wife was, she led the dual enrollment program. He graduated from the technical school and the high school, and he walked immediately into a job opportunity as a welder uh, at uh, Plant Vogel, which is, the only nuclear reactors being built in the country after 30 plus years, making $76,000 a year mm -hmm. plus. Yeah. But it's all because of the reshaping of how we're educating our students beyond but, the traditional reading, writing, arithmetic. So in response to that, and then to Cynthia, I want to just double down on what you're saying. Um, and then Mayor Freeman Wilson, I'm gonna come to you specifically. And then I want uh, Dr. Mason to wrap up this round of the conversation. So I'm gonna tie all three of the things in. Uh, to jump off the point with Georgia, uh, what you were saying, Mr. Mayor, I learned a very something that, that troubled me um, recently, that one of the finer institute, one fine institution in the state of Georgia um, that really has a fantastic engineering program, I'm sure you guys can find it, know what I'm talking about as of now, uh, requires, program, yeah, <laughs> requires AP courses and curriculums in order to get even to apply 
um, into the College of Engineering programs. And so if we're facing that type of dynamic that you're talking about, Cindy, where we don't have qualified teachers to teach STEM course curriculums in K through 12, and then another note, just as a caveat, the challenges that black and brown students are experiencing to be able to elect into AP classes, that's a whole different workshop, Stephanie, when it comes to that. I've done a whole series of conversations on the Mike Muse Show and Sirius XM, shameless plug, regarding accessibility and access to AP, because when I was coming up as a student, it was always an elective. Um, and so I still can't wrap my head around why there's such a difficult barrier of entry. I think that's more political than making sure these high schools keep their scores and the AP exams and the average is high. But again, other conversations definitely don't want to get too sidetracked when it comes to that. So as a solution, um, Mayor Freeman Wilson, when we think about the access to quality STEM teachers, right, within the K through 12 systems for schools or sort of cities and school districts that may be strapped for budgetary means, what can be done? Yes, I, I'm well aware of private-public partnerships. I'm well aware we can do partnerships with the, with the technical trade schools. And that's, that's great and all, but there still is a responsibility for K-12 that math is a basic right, right? Science is a basic right, right? There should need the, the partnership. So what can people be done? People are gonna be listening, they're gonna be tweeting about this. How can we engage in this conversation more specifically to come up with solutions more tactically to help alleviate this, this problem that we're facing? I think that that is where the um, responsibility for local elected officials to advocate. First, to recognize that there is a failure. And in so many instances, um, particularly in the smaller cities, cities other than New York and LA and some of the other cities, mayors don't have any authority over education. And so we have been forced, in fact, we have a responsibility, I would say, to enter into an area where the only authority we, we have comes from the bully pulpit mm -hmm. that we have as mayor and from our ability to really um, collaborate with folks, to say, this is so important to my success as a city, to our success as a community, I want to help you focus on the right things, or I want to help you focus on those things that will secure the future for the next generation. And you really have to convince folk to let you in. That's amazing. Because, you know, it, it, the first answer is, this isn't your business, mm -hmm. Mayor Davis. Go back over there to City Hall yeah. and do what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But you have to say, yes, it is my business. And really, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to say to you that here's what I'm hearing from the business community. Mm -hmm. This is what I know that Google and Amazon and uh, U.S. Steel and GM and all of the other entities, the U.S. Army, right. this is what they are looking for. And when they look at Gary or when they look at other cities, they're not seeing people come prepared. So what are those ways that we can do that? And, and I think that when they talk about the um, power and the opportunity that really exists in partnering with our community colleges, mm -hmm. that's so important. Yeah. Ivy Tech has found some success. And they found success with collaborating with the Indiana universities of the world, with the ball states of the world to say, you know, maybe you just want a two year degree. Mm -hmm. But if we start there, um, even though you can't necessarily teach with a two year degree, you can influence the educational system and you can at least get folks in the door to encourage them to be math mm -hmm. teachers, to be science teachers. I loved math. In fact, yeah. I thought I want to 
wanted to be an engineer. Yes. We'll have to talk about that later yeah. at dinner. Come because on. <laughs> I started, I did three days at General Motors Institute. Oh, GMI. Yeah. My yeah. sister graduated from there I said while three, it was called, okay. Three days. Okay, got it. And I, said, <laughs> I got so excited. You know, <laughs> you have to have some science with that man. Yes, you do. <laughs> and, and I was missing that science. Yeah. But, you know, you have to... If someone had done the experiences, the experiments that yeah. I now see in the STEM programs yeah. for me, then mm. I might be an industrial engineer. Yes. I knew I, I knew I wouldn't be an electrical engineer because yeah, yeah, yeah. physics was the bane of my existence. Yes. But I might be an industrial engineer. We're the cool today. kids. Yeah. We're the smartest cool kids in the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm coming to you, Dr. Mason and, and uh, Ms. Mary. You, you highlight something really specifically. I mean, not even what you said just really highlights where we are with the future of work and where we once were with our economy because GMI, which was then called General Motors Institute of Technology, one of the premier institutions, right? That's how much we're doubling down on manufacturing. This is how much we're doubling down on engineering that we had colleges, a college and a university named after an automotive corporation. Now it's called Kettering University, just for the record. But that's how important manufacturing was to not only the Midwest, right, and the manufacturing belt, but just to the Amer America, like just in general. It was this beacon of light and, and beacon of hope. Uh, I mean, Dr. Mason, as we round out this education perspective, because we started out, I'm trying to tell a story, right? As we started out the conversation, we began at 30,000 foot level describing and putting into context what is the future of work, right? really framing this narrative, right? In order to get to that position where we can transition to the career and workforce of future work, now we're in this space right now that we need education, right? Senior uh, highlighted really K through 12, we really highlighted the complexities of cities and the challenges you guys are facing and providing proper STEM courses in K through 12. But now as we ended at the linchpin of higher education, Dr. Mason, uh, how are you guys thinking about higher education when it comes to uh, either helping, either assisting, or either making things more equitable um, for individuals to enter to this space so they can have a career as we begin to look at this new economy? Let me back up a second before getting to the higher education part, sure. because I think the panelists have mentioned some things that, that are very important, and especially a lot of the, the local programs that, that are taking place. One of the things that I found in, in another line of research looking at African-American children, Latino children in elementary school is knowledge retention over the summer, mm. right? They lose a lot of their information over the summer. Yeah. And so in the fall, you're picking up and trying to get back to where you were when school let out in the spring. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, children from more affluent families are taking courses or they have other life experiences that help them maintain the things that they learn. Mm -hmm. So in the process of, of meeting the educational requirements for computerizations, that issue has to be addressed of helping children maintain the information that they already have over the summer. So you're not, you're not backing way up before you go forward again. Mm -hmm. And also the way we think about education is this some sort of, it's a very discreet activity. You do it until you're 18 and you stop and you don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. If you kind of like school, then you do it until you're 22 and you stop mm -hmm. and you don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And if you just really love school, you just hang in there for a real long time and get a graduate <laughs> degree. But even then, you stop yeah. and you don't do it anymore. The only people who just keep doing it are like PhDs. Yeah. Well. Education, especially to meet the needs of autom automation and computers, has to be a lifelong learning process. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, you, if you're trying to think about the kind of education um, that a child will need like 20 years from now, you have to guess at what that will be today. Well, you're not going to guess right. It's a good point. <laughs> it's just not. I mean, because there, there are technologies that haven't been invented yet. It's always yet advancing. That's mm -hmm. going to create jobs that we don't even know about. Yeah. So you can guess a little bit, but you're going to have to have a process of continuous education. Yeah. And it's not all young people, right? We also have to focus 
You know, young people have parents and grandparents on our seniors. I work at a community center. One of the things that we do is we teach people who are 60 and 70 and 80 how to work on computers. Mm -hmm. And they love it. Mm -hmm. So giving more training, especially more quantitative training, to parents, to grandparents, uncles, aunties, others, this will then help create that, that, that quantitative environment what children are picking up from their seniors. That's interesting you raise that. And so now I'm going to bring in uh, um, State President uh, Harris into the conversation. Uh, I want to put you in conversation with Mayor Davis, and then I'm going to round out with Cynthia when it comes to this next portion here. Um, because entrepreneurship is a key, right? As, as um, Mayor Wilson, you mentioned earlier um, in terms of what's happening in Gary. And you think about you know, maybe entrepreneurs probably 10 years ago used to be the population when they started at age 40 maybe, right? And entrepreneurs really began much later like in, in life. Um, now entrepreneurs, people are thinking about it straight out of high school, right? And people are opting out of college to become entrepreneurs, right? That's a trend, I would say. Um, but in, at AARP, uh, a lot of your members are entrepreneurs. Right, your membership class, right? Um, that are now relying on products and tools that are now solely tech-based, right? To help advance that. How should we be thinking alongside AARP with you guys in terms of uh, how to prepare that workforce of entrepreneurs within that membership category of AARP? Well, there are a number of things that we think the mayors can do. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we see and, and participate in a lot of programs around the city of Boston where um, companies are, mayors are engaging the older workers. They're having um, hackathons, mm -hmm. really, really encouraging them to get involved on um, different, different, different levels, working with community colleges, working with some of the institutes around the city of Boston, and really encouraging them to look at things that they could do now, mm -hmm. and um, also to mentor with the younger people. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we're finding is that we really need, um, our research is showing that we need older workers in the workforce because of the corporate history, yeah. you know, the memory, okay? And um, one of the things that we're finding that's working is actually mentoring the younger workers mm -hmm. with the older workers. Mm -hmm. The younger workers teach them how to do all of the technology and the automation, and they teach them the best practices, the memory, how the things operate in the companies. Right. So those are a number of things that we're seeing that are working. I love that you're highlighting that because, you know, as you're just talking, I'm, I'm just thinking about the importance that we never lose sight as we begin to talk about future work. We're so quick to put it on K through 12, right? And right. we're so quick to put on this millennial workforce that we forget about the older population. And it really retains, I'm thinking about now this black and brown communities, the bedrock of that is entrepreneurs, the mom and pop shops, right? Who rely on that to really support their families, right? Support their children, and in case of black and brown business people, support their grandchildren too as well. Um, and so it's important just for family structure and family dynamics um, that that population is advocated for, right? To make sure that there's tools and resources appointed in order to help protect that space and that place. Um, so with that being said, uh, Mayor Davis, I'm coming to you, and I want to be careful how I phrase some of this stuff because I want Stephanie Sykes and David Harris to invite me back uh, <laughs> as we go into the next round of conversation. In um, particular, Stephanie, I want to highlight now um, something within this, the white paper um, where we really talked about the bottlenecks of automation and cor um, corresponding skills. Um, just for a background information for the audience who will be listening to us, um, the bottlenecks of automation and the skills that we need are in the categories of social skills, creative intelligence, um, perception, and manipulation. Um, as we begin to think about that, and you, in your great cities of Gary, um, and in Augusta, you guys have mentioned partnerships with technical institutes, right? And that is a very buzzword, I think. You know, technical colleges, technical institutes, 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 public-private partnerships. My concern with that, though, is are these technical institutes 
are we too quick to throw it to them as a solution, right? And have we really thought through the type of curriculums that they're teaching in order to prepare to assess that bottleneck of social skills, creative intelligence, perception, uh, and manipulation? And I'm, the question even to go further is, is it too niche, right? Is it too specific to one or two categories of industries? Uh, you, Mayor Davis, and then I'm going to go to okay. Cindy. Yeah. I want to make sure everybody gets time to talk. Well, uh, Mayor Freeman is always so much better at this kind of stuff than I am. So I'll go and first. And I ask because you guys had that the Cyber Institute, yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to tie it to what uh, Ms. Harris uh, indicated as well. Uh, point of personal privilege again. Uh, Augusta was one of Georgia's first age-friendly cities. I do want to add that. Uh, so we are com uniquely tied into what's happening with AARP. Uh, around this conversation of the future of work, uh, the saving grace that we have is that nothing happens without human capital. Nothing. I don't care what it is, I don't care what job it is, even AI, machine learning, and the better Watson gets as he takes data every single day, you still need a human. And we must never lose sight of that. Uh, the challenges around this whole dynamic, though, is as you've said it, and Stephanie put it on the slide earlier, is the social skills, uh, the, the creative intelligence, perception, manipulation. Those are, those are soft things that you don't necessarily see being taught anymore, uh, whether it's uh, an airline stewardess, uh, because people will fly. Someone has to fly the plane. Uh, we may come to a time where you've got an automated plane that people are willing to get in. <laughs> but until that day happens, <laughs> human capital, we must never lose sight of the value of human capital. And so to that end, uh, when you talk about, you know, from a mayor's standpoint and the things that we're attempting to do, uh, it's engaging people across all age groups about how to uh, get into this space uh, around unique careers that are meaningful that add value to their own lives. Uh, because one of the reasons why we saw people not going to the technical schools is because people were told, well, you don't want to be a plumber, you don't want to be a welder, you don't want to be a laborer, you don't want to be an electrician. So, so, so we diminished the value of those skill sets, but we wouldn't be sitting in this room unless we had a carpenter, unless we had a brick mason unless we mm -hmm. had those skill sets. So, so even in our narratives as mayors, we have to do a much better job of storytelling about if I am not 6'6 and able to you know, shoot from 32 feet out, uh, I can still be successful in the world. We also have to, again, in our storytelling, and I'm not sure how we do it in our Latino community, but I know Cindy, you can talk about it, when we start using big words like entrepreneurism, I don't know what you're talking about. When you say, what's your hustle? I know what you're talking about. Because everybody's got a hustle. So we got to talk about it in terms that are meaningful, uh, but create a narrative of where education will play a role in that. And the greater opportunities to hustle may require me to go back to school, may require me to learn new things and then be able to have a conversation about if I'm on the block, I'm not just selling CDs out of my car, but I'm talking about how to take this and create Spotify. Yeah. And we use the term entrepreneurism, but because of technology now, I'm able to sell my music online as opposed to being in the trunk of my car. Right. These are the things that we've got to do a better job of in our narratives as mayors, as policy leaders in black and brown communities, because it's the same concept, I'm just able to scale up. I'm stuck in Gary or Augusta trying to sell 50 CDs out of the car, but if I put it online and put it on iTunes, I've sold 1,500. Well, to keep conversation we got to have. Well, to keep it this code switching and message translation, so essentially going from Master P to Jay-Z with title. Absolutely. <laughs> that was just saying. <laughs> or if you're from the dirty T.I. Hey. Oh, I hope David Harris brings us back. Um, and Cynthia, I am going to come to you to follow up, and then I'm going to come to the audience, too, as well, uh, for Q&A, I want to make this a two-way conversation and for engagements. I think we're kind of getting right now for that moment. I was kind of feeling good to kind of talk to the audience relatively soon here. Uh, and I made that mistake of being the moderator 
culture and uh, not and making assumptions that people knew what I was talking about about the bottlenecks uh, on innovation corresponding. For those in the audience who are watching us, uh, to give context, that just really quickly, the white paper highlights uh, the whole notion of AI future work. Jobs will be displaced, workers will be displaced, but there are key industries and sectors that won't be affected uh, by AI and by future work. And so, therefore, how can we uh, wrap around services through education, through technology, uh, in the areas to, into the bottleneck of uh, bottleneck industries such as social skills, creative intelligence, perception, and manipulations for this background conversation. So, Cindy, as I come to you uh, with your question, I want to frame it from a personal context. Um, and I want to be very careful about this, too, as well, that I don't rub anyone the wrong way who may be who may be listening um, from my hometown. Um, so I'll kind of speak in general as I can. I went to a, a traditional graduating ceremony of high school students. I'll put it out there like that. Um, black and brown. And uh, this is the day where all the high schools from all across the, the city, district-wide, come together and, and celebrate the achievements of a particular organization or entity, I should say, right? They wear their cap and gowns, the parents are there, the families are there. It's a very special, beautiful occasion. Um, I had, the, at the time, had the opportunity to be the keynote speaker of the, of the ceremony. And literally, everyone who went down the row that was black and brown, all said community college. Um, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But it was a large, group of seniors that were graduating. And I sat with the leader of the organization later, and I talked to him about it, and he said that is something that's been bothering him. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I just, <laughs> that's how much it gets to me, right, in the sense of are, how are we placing expectations on black and brown individuals? I support technical schools and technical institutes. I support community colleges, as long as it's a choice. Right. My issue is that if it's getting forced, right, without having the option for other. So I'm just curious in your work with Naleo, as you guys are advocating around education for black and browns, do you see this coming up, right? Is this something that is on the table that you guys are discussing? And how then do we balance this notion of making sure that individuals go, that we identify who can be strong and become a welder and make 75K out of high school, right? But those who can also go to a four-year institution too as well. Yes. So that's, a, 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 I'm gonna try to address that, a really big question. Um, and I think that the white paper also highlights that, right? Sort of like attainment and success rates um, for black and brown students in post-secondary institutions. Um, I went to community college after high school. Um, I'm very proud of having my AA degree, and then I went on to Cal State Fullerton, so that's the CSU system in California, and then I went to graduate school at UCLA. So I like to say that I'm a proud um, sort of graduate of the California Master Plan. Um, and unfortunately, um, for both predominantly four-year institutions, access rates are still low. Attainment rates are still low. So that is something that policymakers, of course it bothers folks, right? Especially if you feel like it's not a choice. I know that I went to community college because that's sort of what I just knew and, and that's where I decided to go. Um, but there is a different story for students that do work up and there's a, sort of a culture of low expectations, um, sort of low academic standards and they don't have the opportunity to go to a four-year institution. I think, um, Policymakers at community colleges are working very, very hard. Um, in fact, all policymakers at higher education sort of institutions, because they know higher ed is at a crux. People are saying, should I even go to community college? Should I even go to a four-year institution? What is going to be the return on my investment? Am I going to have a job after I graduate? Yeah. So it is at a crux. Um, I don't think you're going to meet any policymaker that, it, that is not going to say, I am working hard to ensure that we continue to open access for all students, predominantly black and brown, but also they are looking at these pathways starting at K-12 to post-secondary institutions and saying, how are we teaching kids traditionally? What do we need to change? Yeah. What resources do we need to allocate to ensure that these pipelines are renovated and they work for students in our community in order for them to have the option 
to either go to a community college. Again, community colleges are doing amazing work in ensuring that folks, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say kids or students, because we know that there's K-12 students, like the white paper says, and there's also the workforce, so that's adult learners, mm -hmm. right? They're doing amazing jobs to ensure that both of these segments are coming to school and they are being equipped with the skills that they need to be dynamic players in the labor market. Um, but again, it, it's something that still needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I'm in education. Um, I've been in this work for almost a decade, and I come home sometimes and I go, this is a failed public policy. Like, what, <laughs> what is it gonna take? Um, and, but one thing that I could tell you is that I'm sure everyone here has experienced this frustration, um, but we need to continue to sort of employ, again, I'm gonna come to these four. We all have the power to convene key stakeholders in our regions. We all have the power, whether you're a policymaker or not, to strengthen these partnerships and continue this work. Maybe you don't have the role to allocate resources, but maybe, again, convene with partners that can. Um, and we could all sort of promote and champion all of these policies. It's, yeah. gonna, it's gonna take a lot. Um, we know that black and brown communities will continue to be drivers of change as the workforce, as the workforce continues to change. And again, I just wanna thank um, our leaders, Mayor Wilson and Mayor Davis. Um, mayors are just in a pivotal role where they could really be sort of drive transformational change in the region. So I wanna thank our mayors and everyone doing this work. You answered that big question fantastically. I, I, it's, it's just, it's, I knew you could handle this it. This could be like a two day, actually yeah, yeah. like a week symposium. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, you handled it well with the California Master Plan. I gotta start using that, that was really great. Mary Wilson, I feel it seem you wanna chime in I, I before we take wanna, it to the audience. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to add to that, and, and she did do a, an amazing job, affordability. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely matters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just don't know mm -hmm. how parents do it right now. Yeah. You know, because if you don't have any money at all, mm -hmm. then you're probably good. Mm -hmm. You can go to school for four years. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of money and your family is willing to invest, yeah. then you're good. Yeah. But if you're in the middle, yeah. And you are faced with making a decision to go into significant debt. Yeah. Then some folks, and understandably so, just say, you know, I'm good. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to a community college. I'm going to get a technical yeah. certificate. I'm mm -hmm. going to do something that is going to be a lot cheaper and pay off a lot quick. You and Cindy are in conversations together really highlighted the range of that question um, and really highlighted the nuance of, of that question, um, which is also to the reason why I had tossed it uh, to Mayor Davis in the sense of the standards that there are technical colleges and in these institutions in, in the tech world to make sure they're equipped uh, to handle the nuance of students uh, but also, too, the nuance of industries, sure. right? That it just isn't one specific thing. And so you guys did a fantastic job with that. Now the audience, if you guys have any questions, my man in the corner with the cool glasses. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris. Um, my name is Chris. I'm a former mayor of Hawthorne, California. I came out here for a few questions regarding the cannabis industry. You know, we're talking about technology. We're talking about the future. Uh, the cannabis industry will surpass technology with the next four or five years. We're talking about $70 billion in new funding for jobs, engineering, manufacturing. What are you guys doing in your local cities and states? Because there's only 29 states as part of this right now. The federal government just passed a farm bill to allow CBD growing in local cities throughout the nation. No one's talking about that. Everyone's talking about manufacturing cars and whatnot, which is fine. You have to uh, be more educated in terms of technology, but you guys, are, there's a whole boat being missed right now. And you don't want it just to fly over your head because there's actually colleges writing curriculum for cannabis. You have to pay attention to this because it's going, it's going to come regardless. And it's not only that, it's helping cancer patients, vets with PTSD, so forth and so on. What are you guys doing to be proactive on the jobs that are coming regardless? is here. For the time constraints, I'll have one of the mayors address it, um, and then uh, Ms. Harris, if you want to engage and do it too as well. 
it's always nice when you have an attorney next to you. Because <laughs> the next thing I'm going to say, I will probably need an attorney. <laughs> in the great state of Georgia, uh, I spent eight years in the legislature. Uh, we started this conversation with medical marijuana uh, in this most recent legislative session uh, post what happened uh, at the federal government around uh, cannabis. Uh, the state of Georgia has now stepped into this space. Uh, there's a uh, authority that's being created uh, to, quote, kind of regulate this discussion uh, with the idea of potentially having, you know, five licenses um, in the state of Georgia where you've got, you know, five distinct entities who will, you know, spend time in this space and as it progresses, maybe more. My challenge with that as a former legislator, once always a legislator, it's in your blood, is uh, the hypocrisy of this discussion. Uh, we lock up black and browns disproportionately for walking around with a dime bag. Uh, but now I want to create space for us to do something different and unique in this. Uh, I think that's the hypocrisy of this, uh, where in the same conversation in the great state of Georgia, um, the way the legislation is written, someone who looks like me won't necessarily be one of those five licenses. Mm -hmm. That's the hypocrisy of that. Uh, but if we're going to create uh, equity and economies of scale and, more importantly, opportunity, uh, we've got to reframe that discussion. So we're having that conversation in Augusta, uh, particularly around what can I do at the local level, uh, absent not being able to decriminalize marijuana, uh, because what has happened at the state is going to take place. I can be a part of that discussion uh, and see it happen around us, or we can do what I've done in Augusta, and that is begin having a conversation with folks who are interested, uh, because we are the state's uh, primary area for medical teaching. Uh, the state's flagship medical teaching university is in Augusta. And so I want to harness all of that power or leverage it all to create opportunity that then, you know, drills down to meaningful careers for people because I've got a strong manufacturing base to be able to do that. And I've got substantial land assets to be able to do that in terms of growing it. So that's what we're doing in Augusta. President Harris, would you like to add on from that? Because uh, you asked a really fantastic question. So I, I, I enjoy having a, a policy municipality perspective, but from a member perspective, because future work, growing economy, growing industry, uh, that is a new class of customers uh, that could be interested from the medicinal aspect of it, but specifically the CBD oil um, that could be used for topical things for. Well, I, I would agree with Mayor Davis. I think as you begin to explore and go into these new avenues, you have to really be careful. I think we are learning lessons in the city of Boston. I think there's a whole question of going back to the equity things. And uh, so the only thing that I'd say is it's an opportunity. I think we have an opportunity, and this may be an, an avenue where we can encourage um, older workers who are a little bit more mature, I would think, to begin to look at these kinds of jobs and careers. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that we have to be very, very careful. And as you approach these, look around at what's happening in other states and not make some of the mistakes that they're making. And mm -hmm. um, really, really look at the equity, because that is a problem in the city of Boston. I'm even thinking now in the sense of uh, the Senate Agriculture Committee, um, the farm bill that you mentioned to brother earlier. I do a lot of conversations around this space in particular, and then also too around the Agricultural Committee in the Senate, um, but in particular in terms of the inequities of farming and black farmers in particular, right? And black farmers are an aging population, um, on how to participate in this economy. And it's even happening in Florida. So I'm assuming, Dr. Mason, that's why you seem like you're popping Piping up for a question or no? Because <laughs> you guys had the lawsuit in Florida with the, with the black farmers. So. Yeah. <laughs> black farmers in Florida and over the South, I mean, we've had mm. some problems with being discriminated against by the agriculture department. But on this issue of, 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 of marijuana, I mean, I, I actually, I mean, I'm an academic, so a researcher, so I do what researchers do. Uh, I research stuff. I have a graduate student who's looking into this issue, 
on the, the impact of recreational marijuana laws on other types of criminal activity. And, and actually, it tends to reduce them. Um, I would advocate for legalizing marijuana. I went to school in Ann Arbor, man. They had hash bash on campus. Go blue. <laughs> uh, so, that hash bash was something uh, else. Beyond that, I, I was recently invited to participate I, I teach at Florida State, but Florida a and Historically Black College, is just putting together a group of people to look at the impact of recreational marijuana laws and how it would affect African Americans, uh, medical marijuana, and how it would affect African Americans in Florida. But, but a word of caution. You know, people said that when we, went, when, when we eliminated the numbers guy, and got the lottery that this was going to do big wonders for education. You didn't eliminate the numbers. No. <laughs> it did big wonders. Still playing. It's, still playing. It's done wonders for the people who own the lottery. Yeah. It hasn't really done much for education. The same thing with alcohol. You said, well, well, we're going to end prohibition and tax it. Well, it's a lot of tax money come from alcohol. It's, I don't know if it's really helped education all that much. It's really a great so, point in terms of the fiduciary responsibility. One so of those revenue sources. legalizing marijuana, which I'm in favor of. I mean, like I don't. I think it's just stupid to send people to prison for getting high. I don't advocate that anybody gets high, but I don't want to send them to prison either. Yeah. All right. So with that being said, any other questions due to time? The guy in the corner, and then you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is William Greenlaw. I'm from the great city of Gary, Indiana. Hey. <laughs> well, we see where this question is going to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is in general. Um, there's a lot of emphasis placed on teaching people the code, but often in an economy, the barriers to entry and the amount of education required rises sharply, and the people who are at the lowest rungs of the access are less and less able to keep up. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there are other professions can for example, the legal profession, in which there are certain aspects of it that are specialized but don't require specialized knowledge. A good example of this is perhaps mediation or bankruptcy filing or no-fault divorce. What interest is there, in your opinion, in your cities or in state governments to de-specialize and lower the licensure requirements for things that perhaps anyone could do without necessarily having to get a three-year law degree? So, in in the interest of time, I let one panelist to respond so we can get to other questions in the audience. I don't know if Gary, you want to take a point of personal privilege, or Cynthia, sure. this is right up your alley with policy too as well, or maybe both of you, I'll allow. <laughs> First, okay. I just want to um, say how proud I am of William. Mm -hmm. He is nice. a first year law school student here at Harvard. Oh, awesome. And I've known him since he was 12 years old. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that as we look at the future of work, he raises a very important point. We've been focused on technology, on automation, but the point is that as people are innovated, if you will, out of jobs, what are some other opportunities that exist? Mm -hmm. And um, and so to the extent that we are looking at other opportunities, I would certainly say in the law, that's one area. And there are many, many other areas where you could sort of deregulate, um, sort of uh, reduce your licensure requirements. But here's the problem. Mm -hmm. who, make the, who makes those decisions? Yes. The lawyers, mm -hmm. right? And so, you, <laughs> Williams, you, oh, you to, answered your own question. It, it ha there has to be a groundswell. <laughs> and also, too, William, that is also, too, on the white paper, uh, to highlight that on page five, um, kind of talks about some of that work, some of that space. Uh, Cynthia, do you want to add on to that from a policy perspective? So just the question was about sort of the working requirements mm -hmm. for something like coding versus the legal profession. So I'm thinking of partnerships like policymakers come together with business 
I love Google, thank you for being a partner, but folks like Google are the ones that are saying these are the requirements um, that are needed sort of from the workforce. And I know that our policymakers, I'm thinking um, at the state legislative level who approve curriculums, I'm thinking of school board members who allocate resources in order to implement those curriculums. A lot of those things are happening in partnership with business. Mm -hmm. It is the role of our policymakers then to say, hey, let's talk and have a conversation are these truly the requirements that are needed yeah. um, from our students? When we think about jobs and getting a job, it is really, really hard to make that like one-on-one -on -one connection when you really think about it. You, yeah. All these applications, these informational interviews, and it takes a lot for them to get to that place where someone's like, you're hired. Mm -hmm. um, so that really is driven by business um, and policymakers, and it is the role of policymakers at whatever level you are at um, to sit back at the table and say, we need to have a conversation about these requirements. Okay, I have five minutes remaining, so I wanna keep us on time so we can quick, go get some reception. Point. And to, uh, my friend right here. Oh, uh, for the uh, camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here. My name's Allison. I work at Mass Hire Department of Career Services, which is the workforce um, central office for the state. So automation is super visible, right? Like you see it when you're going through the grocery, lo grocery store line and, and all of that. And so I get why it's at the top of people's minds. I'm inclined to think that the more proximate threat to the labor supply is climate change. When the... Um, Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Irma in Puerto Rico happened. Most of those evacuees came to Holyoke, Massachusetts. It was an extraordinary strain on the system, particularly the workforce system. I think we really need to have a conversation about how to have greater resiliency because there are going to be increasingly more massive displacements, not just in coastal areas, right? You have wildfires, you have tornadoes. I, I get the automation thing. Climate change is happening right now. And I'm curious about what the workforce system's role is around it beyond just creating career pathways to photovoltaic professions or hydroponics. So what are some specific initiatives that you could think of that are taking seriously that approach? Any panelists want to take that? One panelist? Just as you guys think about which one's going to take that, that's a really great question that you raise, uh, just in the sense of when you look at the climate change, even with the Amazon fires that's happening in terms of how it's going to change weather patterns, how it's going to affect the farming industry within the Midwest, uh, and all that kind of cool stuff. So anyone want to take that? There is an entire movement uh, among mayors, largely, uh, that is focused on climate change. It was initially started by Mayor Bloomberg, but um, all of us have, or most of us have embraced it in a way that we are not only looking at what we can do to create more resilient cities, but how we can uh, develop our communities around in terms of workforce development. So what are some of the greener jobs? For instance, in the city of Gary, what we're doing is focusing on creating a green community where people use solar panels, where people are more likely to grow their food than not, where folks are really looking at ways to make their houses more, um, more green, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, and actually building green from the ground up. Uh, lead certified buildings at the city uh, and um, encouraging lead certification for private buildings. And that's just Gary, who is not a leader in this area. I think you will find cities all over the country engaged in that work. Yeah. So one final question before I bring Stephanie and David up for closing remarks. Right here in the front. Thank you so much. Wildlife Federation. Thank you so much, Simone Lightfoot, National Wildlife Federation. I also sit on the school board in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Go and, blue. Yeah. Happy today. And when you talked about community college, I just want to, the cost was one that you hit on, so important. We're finding, too, that students struggle in that first year. They go away to college, even our very privileged students. We'd be amazed at how many come back that first year because they weren't quite prepared <clears> for <throat> it. Community college also allows for you to stay at home 
and purchase a vehicle and go to school. Young people we found weren't interested in ownership as much as we used to be, as much as purchasing experiences. I wanted a car. They like Uber. They're good, like they don't need some of the same things. And so just looking at the socioeconomic and the way in which this generation handles ownership, handles proximity, um, still want to live at home and not necessarily are able to move out, all of those things matter. The other question I had though, was some of you talked about your labor, how you're working with labor. How do you um, deal with your unions? Have you had trouble with your unions, your AFSMEs? of the world. You may have innovative ideas, but the labor <laughs> industry uh, checks that. And so can you just touch a little bit on, it's not all the panacea, there's a lot of work that has to be done. I had to be the bad guy, but one mayor due to time. Thank you. So my father was a union guy. Uh, he's since retired. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with the unions uh, in Augusta. <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the school cyber pathways. At the same time that we were doing that, most recently, in fact, in the fall of last year, we stood up uh, a trades skill uh, segment of a high school in Augusta, Georgia, uh, in partnership with our local unions. So now we're teaching them how to do plumbing, welding, electrical, crafts, all of the crafts, right there in our high school, uh, T.W. Josie. Uh, because of the importance of wanting to, uh, I'm struggling with my words today, uh, highlight the importance of having individuals who are able to build and to still make stuff, uh, where before we kind of devalued that and said, well, you don't want to go into vocational training and or education, when the reality of it is that's how America works. It's how we are here. That's why. People are living, quote, the American dream. So we've got a very unique but a strong and continually growing relationship with the unions. They matter all across America. So with that being said, panelists, you guys have been fantastic. Uh, thank you for um, answering these questions in such an engaging way. Thank you, audience, for being so fantastic. Uh, the panelists will be around at the reception for those of you who didn't get a chance to ask your questions. At this time, I'll bring up David and or Stephanie uh, for closing remarks. Thank you. So I'm going to just say a word, and then I want Stephanie too. I want to I want to thank all of you. I, I'm sure you know I learned so much uh, from this conversation, and it, it was so rich and rewarding. Uh, you know, thankfully, uh, it'll also it will live forever on our website, and I encourage you to think about sharing it with people uh, to help get some of these insights. I have to say, I work for the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. That's who we are, and. It warms my heart. I do a lot of events here, but to do an event here in which the entire event is people of color. It, it really, uh, it means something to me. You know, we're here at Harvard Law School. You know, Mike's making jokes about Harvard Law School, getting invited back to Harvard. Uh, this is the future of Harvard. And, uh, and, and I think it's really important, and I'm really pleased to be able to do this work with the African American Mayors Association. Thank you all. Thank you. I just want to thank everyone again for coming out. I don't want to stay in between you all and reception. But I just want to give another round of applause to Mike Muse and thank you for your moderation of tonight's events. Um, I just want to acknowledge all of our partners and just take another moment just to say that I am so honored to work for the African American Mayors Association. We are at an amazing moment of black mayors leading cities of all sizes, large and small, women mayors, millennial mayors, and we have a fantastic leader right now with Mayor Hardy Davis at Augusta who allows us to do the work um, that you heard tonight. So I just want to thank you all and just say that our hashtag right now is Our Mayors Lead, and we are we're just so proud to work side by side with these phenomenal mayors and all of our partners here this evening. So thank you again. Thank you for coming out. Please enjoy um, the reception next door and we're all available for questions. Have a great evening. <laughs>